let's start again with uh, uh, <clears throat> within principles insight. And here we are still in the Anatta Nupasana. <clears throat> now last, on Monday, yeah. So on Monday we talk about the different types, different modes of Anatta. Beginning from, uh, beginning from the first insight where one begins to see the knowledge that you can able to distinguish discriminate the mind and body, which are, they are two different entities. Yeah. And when they, you can able to do that, then you don't see any form of that entity. It's always these two entities. Uh, so with that, it is a kind of, it's a mode of anatta. Hmm. <clears throat> now when you go, you go as you practice further, uh, you train further, then you begin to see into the conditionality. You see causes and its effect, or cause and conditions. Uh, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we can see, we can able to notice this nature of this in, intention or the mind more clearly. Then how the mind arises, then the body arise, uh, the body takes the body arises or the body moves or the body do something. Hmm? Uh, and then we see this cause effect, cause effect, cause and its resultant. Again and again we will see it in many ways, in even in a more minute manner. Hmm? Then not only that, the, the anatta takes you into even higher, into deeper, where you begin to see that all that your nature of your noting and sometimes can become very chaotic. Very chaotic as if like your noting is running everywhere. But you're still noting. It's not like that in the past where you can have a very smooth, um, you know, predictable noting. But this time the noting or the objects runs very chaotically, and sometimes yogi may think that they are digressing because they have never seen all these phenomena or all these experiences before. So this form of its chaotic movements, they are also expression of another mode of anatta. Whereas at this time, the chaos that is going on inside there is totally not within your control. Totally, it's not your control anymore. There's no I that is involved. It's just carry on, it arises, it passes away. No matter how it comes, it goes, it will go on its own. So sometimes the yogi felt very um, difficult eh, when noticing all these type of things. Because very much in the past, we are, we wanted to, so-called control our nature of our meditation. We want to walk in a certain manner. We want to have the rising, falling in a certain manner. We want the in-breath, out-breath just to be beautiful, to be nice, to be pleasant. When things changes, and not only changes, it changes fast, and then we felt very uncomfortable and sometimes things become chaotic. That is all, that, that chaotic movement is shows into anatta, uh, all this anatta. Now as you go higher and deeper into this insight, the anatta deepens into such a way that, you know, that <clears throat> things are going to come and go, arises, passes away, changes, and you have no control, no say about it. Uh, that even sometimes it goes into deeper, that you can truly see how your mind actually perform, how actually they arise in just a microsecond maybe, before an action takes place or a body takes place. And every movement, every little tiny movement, every little thought that you're going to make, the mind knows it first. Uh, 
then sometimes when you look into it, it becomes quite scary. <laughs> uh, it can become quite uh, difficult. Uh, uh, uh. Then with that, uh, there's nothing for you to hold on anymore. Especially when it comes to the accumulation at the knowledge of equanimity of formations. Sankara Upekanyana. And at that point, also the the all the experiences of your noting becomes very like uh, you know as if like you are disconnected and you just watch everything because during that time the mindfulness and everything in their tip top condition as as you never felt that it's such a high concentration high mindfulness everything is so balanced and it's very sharp and you can be able to do a very long lasting practice hmm? that not, not only that but any form of pleasure or pleasantness that arises in the body or even in the mind or any form of fear any form of things that you used to have a lot of fear or things you or memories that it makes you very sad or make you very angry this time the mind does not react towards it it's just observe it whatever that comes and just see it as they arises and passes away arises passes away moment after moment nothing all these emotional states does not affect you at all yeah? and you you just see them as not yours all the past events sometimes you know like usually when we are not meditating all these thoughts or in the or the future then there's always connected with the i i am i was that and that person makes me angry and here when it comes into sankara upeka all these things cut off and you still actually see the memory but it does not affect you at all that means that the, there's no i that is involved during that time hmm? so it's it's very powerful. So we, we, the day we stop until there, all this anatta nupasana. Mm. But tonight we are going to carry on a little bit more on that, on anup, anatta nupasana, especially on the Sankara Upeka. Then we'll look into it, how the, maybe a little bit, we'll see if we got time or not. Huh? Where am I? Okay, let's let's look into this a little bit. Okay. Hold on now. Yeah. This was la <clears throat> okay, okay, last week. All right, okay. Hmm. So so we look into the anatta nupasana and also when we when we look into the number 15 of the 18 principle insight now, one who develops correct knowledge and vision yatta buddha jnana dasanang abandons misinterpretation or adherence due to confusion now, one who abandons adherence to the delusion by developing knowledge and things as they really as they really are okay let me put it okay okay hey? I keep on running. Okay, yeah, yeah. Now this is this one. Uh, this is okay. Now, this is one. This is we stop until Sankara Upeka towards all formations. Huh? Uh, tonight, what are we going to talk? Okay. Now we're going to we're going to see this a little bit more. Huh? We're going to look into this a little bit more on this seeing things as they really are it is also it is also a kind of like a repetition of a monday's talk in the sense that in the monday's talk we talk from the perspective of the development of insight huh? the development of insight but tonight the talk is from the you know the context of um, context of from the text and how they 
look at all the insights and so on uh, and they compile it in a certain in a certain way yeah. uh, misinterpretation or wrong in wrong interpretation wrong misinterpretation not wrong anymore can I be double wrong <laughs> okay now seeing things as they really are here in the text it says that to abandon the misinterpretation of solidity when we say this word solidity the word here is more of like being unity or oneness rather than like material solidness you know huh? um, this this nature of this solidity is involves materiality of course and also involves mental also so mind and matter is we are looking into the word solidity here huh? not just don't think of the word as uh, you know something like just like a hard or soft or a, a table or a floor which is solid no not not in that sense huh? but the thing is that because of the way we perceive nature of what we see and what we hear from that's coming in from all our six senses and now that day we talk about wrong perception arises wrong cognition and from the wrong cognition arises the wrong view huh? from perception of self arises the cognition of self from the cognition of self arises the wrong view of self huh? so here is because that how we perceive or how we conceptualize whatever that is going through our senses going through our senses now seeing things as they really are now this abandons the misinterpretation of solidity no? now here again seeing things as they really are means that beginning from first insight and the second insight and all the way towards enlightenment and of course when we talk about that also carry on after enlightenment going into first stage second stage third stage until arahanship Hmm? So there's always some degree of misinterpretation uh, until one has able to abandon everything or eradicate everything, then there's no more wrong perception. So even right up to right up to anagami, uh, the third stage, there's still a little bit of wrong perception. That's why they are still in samsara. Huh? <clears throat> now, uh, what I mean by this misinterpretation or wrong perception of continuity, santa ti gana, uh, then samugaha gana or kicca gana or aramanya gana, aramana gana, uh, solidity of continuity or oneness of continuity. Now, when we perceive people or when we perceive things we perceive them as one that, that fit, perceive them as like a solidity in the sense that when we say the person we gave the name the person we gave the <clears throat> we gave <clears throat> the person is that with that particular shape particular particular voice particular way and then we <clears throat> look at them as a person, as, as a whole, in that sense. Huh? So when we look at them as a whole, then with that perception, then it arises the thinking that them, then there must be an I or you or he or she. Huh? We, we already have this nature in us from from since if 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 i can say this since the beginning of our samsara uh, and it's going to continue on from life after life 
And we do not know another way of getting out of this wrong perception. And exactly because of that, we don't even realize that it is wrong perception. We always believe that it, it must be right because that's the only thing. Yeah. So, so when we look at all this, with all this uh, like a person, like a light, or sorry, like a person, like a, anything that is solid, or even even like when you go into like a, a self, a soul, or consciousness, and so on, uh, then we always look at them as something that is always continuous. Like the, like the, for example, if one believes the nature of the soul, then is always look at it as something continuous. Even you have jhana also. Even you practice samatha meditation, and you develop the right jhana too, because in the right jhana, or even in the wrong jhana or whatever, huh? At least right jhana is not too bad, huh? <laughs> rather than wrong one. You you still see continuity. You still see continuity in the jhana, and you come out from the jhana, you think about the jhana that you have earlier on. Continuous. There's nothing break up. There's nothing disappear. There's nothing there. You see a continuity of the state of mind. Yeah? So, if if we keep on doing this since in our life after life, even in the past we have developed some meditation, then we develop and we we'll keep on seeing this continuity, we cannot able to break away. Even, uh, even, even, you, you learn about signs. Then we think about, oh, science, and then we look into, okay, the table in front of me. Okay, the table in front of me, you got the carbon, you got this one, and all that thing, you know. Conceptually, we can understand. Oh, things are not really, in a way, in a, that one solidness is always made up of all this atom and this and that. So too, some of you may be learning Abhidhamma, also the same thing, you know. You look at the body, oh, the body got these four primary um, uh, materiality, uh, the four Mahabhuta, uh, primary elements. And then you got all these 24 derived elements, oh, you know all those things. Very good. Then you look into the mind, you study, oh, I got 89 consciousness, and I, don't, I got so many 52 Chetasika, and this and that, and oh, very good. But then when you when you don't learn about all these things, huh? no, sorry, when you put uh, that all aside, huh? when you look at somebody with everything, still oneness, huh? still whole at uh, the person. Right? It's only it's only the it's only you have a better perception. Uh, you have a better not to say that you are wrong, huh? not to say that you are wrong. You have a better perception. But the concept of continuity still goes inside you, still flows inside you. Although you're thinking it's better. Huh? If, if those things, uh, you're learning about Abhidhamma or learning about all the sciences and so on, if you can able to break up your continu continuity, then sooner or later you'll be enlightened also. Nibbana already. Uh, uh. So, but then we cannot do that. Uh, we know that we cannot do that. So, finally, it has to come in into the vipassana and not samatha. And again, as I said, this vipassana it's not easy to come by. Vipassana is only arises when you have the teachings of the Buddha. So you run around in samsara; it's very hard for you to go and find a vipassana practice. Sometimes, even even in the according to the text la, huh? sometimes if some Buddha's dispensation is quite short. So short that means it's very quickly disappear the dharma. Uh, this dispensation, this this one, this Buddha sasana, it's a bit longer than the vipassana is there, and yet and yet sometimes the vipassana is all sometimes have very much corrupted. 
Yeah. So in order for us to understand which one is not corrupt or corrupt or whether what is right or wrong, finally we have to put ourselves into the practice. If we put ourselves into the practice, then we keep all the biased thinking aside, all thinking and whatever, just see things as it is. If it's going to rise, it's going to rise. If it fall, it falls. You see it as they are. You in-breath is an in-breath, out-breath is an out-breath. We don't go and interpret that this in-breath is connected to the lungs, connected to the this, and all this thinking coming in. Yeah? So, so we just keep on watching that thing. If it's in-breath, in-breath you know it. Out-breath, out-breath you know it. Uh, then you, you notice some sensation like a pain, you know that it's a sensation. You don't go and feed it more than, than, than necessary. For example, some people feed it more in a sense like, oh, the, the blood vessel is blocked, the nerves is something and all that thing. If you feed on it, that means you already goes into additional perception already. Then we don't want to have this um, biased type of thoughts that arises. But again, a lot of people, a lot of yogis actually attach to the biased thoughts rather than seeing things as they really are. Just to see the pain, what is that for a lot of people? What is that? What is there to see just in the in-breath, out-breath? What is there to see in the rising and falling? What is there to see in the walking? What is there to see in the movement of an arm? What is there to see? And because they cannot able to penetrate further, everything will still remain as solidity. Yeah. So when when it comes to the practice, then one has to make a lot of effort. In the beginning, it's not going to be easy. Now, a lot of times, yogis begin to break solidity. Not even the first insight yet, but solidity is the first thing that you're going to break. As I said, as I mentioned, many yogis, when they struggle and they go in and out from a retreat after retreat, they begin to see that their breath or their rising, falling or their lifting, pushing, dropping are not continuous. They break up like two or three breathing, two or, two or three in breath, two or three out breath. Now it's stagger, 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 and then it ends. Uh, then, or like rising, one after another, one after another, one another, then it ends. All these things is to break away that solidity, the solidity of continuity. Yeah? Because right now, we don't only feel that the breath is just as one, but they are make that at that moment of time, we know that there's the, the movement of the breath, it's two or three movement that's inside it. Yeah? So again, when you notice all these things again and again, then all the objects begins to break because of the nature of the wisdom, mindfulness, concentration, when they all come together, they penetrate and begin to show you. Yeah? You begin, if you train yourself properly, then once you see, able to see all this break, this in-breath, out-breath, let's say it starts to break, then if you pay the same amount of clarity and observation into your, let's say your movement of your arm, then it's going to show you the arm is breaking, breaking, breaking. No, no, no. The movement of the arm is breaking, 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 breaking. Then if you pay the same attention with the same clarity again and you direct it to your movement of your leg, also, you're going to show you the same thing. It's just like when your torch light is that powerful, everything you shine with that particular torch, torch light and that power of the light, it will show you wherever that you're going to point it at. It's going to be that bright, you're going to see that much. You're not going to see more, but you're going to see that much. Huh? So you train. So you keep on training day in, day out, you keep training, yeah. then you begin to see, you keep on breaking a lot of things. Then you begin to see the mind itself is not in the sense of continuous too. Yeah? Now, 
the continuity here, usually when it comes to the meditation, yogi is able to see the breaking up of the continuity in the body first, usually, you know, because the mind is more, slightly more subtle. So sometimes yogi noticing that, um, you know, the, the rising falling is breaking up into a number of parts. In breath, out breath is breaking up number of parts. But when they look at the mind, the feel the noting mind itself, you know, direct the mind to notice itself. Then it says, one lump only. Nothing else is there. You just see one lump. Not lump, la, sorry. Yeah. Like, just knowing on here. Then you see, you're able to see this one. But you don't, don't give up yet. Uh, yeah? You just keep on going and going and you keep on building up that mindfulness. Uh. Sooner or later, you begin to see the mind also come. After that, another mind. After that, another mind. After that, another mind. <laughs> yeah? it, sh it, it shows you that um, it begin to break down a lot of things. So to do to all in the sense that to dismantle the continuity. And that is where when you begin to see and to slowly into all that thing, then the first insight begin to arise and you begin to see things as they really are. Yeah? Uh, as as the first uh, then then you see those things. Yeah? So it, it, in a way that it needs to be examined closely. You cannot do vipassana nowadays. Now, I said nowadays people sometimes I hear people do vipassana. You just sit down there, a little bit of rising, a little bit of falling, a little bit of walking. Even they say they every day meditate until for the past, you know, past two years they have not gone into retreat. They sit at the home, they meditate every day. But it cannot come into really to break down all this continuity. They still see rising, falling, rising, falling. I mean, it's good not to say it's bad. It's still good and better that they don't do at all. But the penetration has not really come in yet. Hmm? So it needs actually a lot of these things and a lot of people that I know, a lot of yogis that I know, you need retreats. You need proper retreats in order for you to, to develop some degree of mental uh, sharpness and penetrativeness of the mind. Hmm? So when you're able to see that, which is wonderful, you, know, you can see you begin to break up that solidity of, of this one. Hmm? <clears throat> now, as you begin to go further into the development, you know, then everything you just see is only arising and passing away. The continuity changes even more, even more clearer. Uh, it, it, it begins to show you arising and passing away at the fourth insight knowledge. Right? Things arrive, pass away, arrive, pa, 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 pa. it come and uh, go again and again. Uh, but a recent, I mean, a few years ago, a few years ago, there are people interpret that uh, this rising and falling, uh, oh, sorry, sorry, this arising and passing away. When we say, and normally when we say arising and passing away, we say that it's moment after moment. It just doesn't stop. It's just like when you look into the light, and the light will keep on peep up, peep up, peep up, peep up, peep up. It's not one solid light, but it's it come on, come and go. So something like that, when we look into the mind and also look into the body, it very fast. You know, sometimes the sometimes you may hear that um, you know, uh, when a a thought that passing through, uh, uh, no, sorry, uh, thinking that is passing through, there may be a lot of uncountable consciousness has passed through. Uh, uh, or you move and your arms, then you say, oh, there's a countless consciousness that's passing through. Uh, uh, for us, we don't need to see all this countless consciousness. What we need to see is that we need to see the consciousness, of course. We need to see the object. And the nature we see is to see its changes. 
You have to see the Anicca Dukkha Anatta, not to count how many inside there. You know. Don't be like they are Bidama scholar, they want to meditate. Huh? Now, some are not all, you know, because some are inside here. They meditate, oh, they want to calculate how many thought moments they're coming in. They want to Bamanjali Jale Swinya, you know? Not like that. Like. <laughs> We, we meditate in order to see its anicca, dukkha, anatta so that we can get out of samsara. Not calculate how many chekasika you have. While you are meditating, yeah? how to calculate how many consciousness you're going to have. Yeah? That is not your area. Yeah? So, so we need to see those things. Huh? So the arising and passing away, it's keep on breaking up and you see the discontinuity even much more clearer, moment after moment. But, that, but then there are people that I know of like, huh? some years back that when people interpret that arising and passing away moment after moment, huh? then they interpret it as just like your they do sitting meditation, all right? You do sitting meditation. Huh? Then they give you a counter, you know, give a hand counter. Then after that, you, you sit already. You must, mm, they said that for the last three days of your two weeks retreat, huh? three days, the last three days, you must not sleep, you know. Must not sleep, okay. So you don't sleep. Then after that, they give you a counter. So you meditate already. Huh? Then your head nodding one time. Then you meditate twice. Then you, you press, you know. You, then you press again. Uh, press again because 24 hours you don't sleep already. Huh? So you, you for one hour or one and a half hours, you sit down there. Then if you have like, the counter shows you 50. Huh? Then it says that you see 50 times of arising and passing away already. How about that? Hmm. 50 times of arising and passing away oh. just because they can they see the counter and and therefore you are in the knowledge of arising and passing away Udaya Bayanyana how easy yeah. and they're still teaching uh, they're still teaching out there and people believe them and people believe them hmm. what can I say? I mean, we are in a, in a, I'm also in the same place with them, but I'm not a teacher, I'm just another monk when you're there, yeah? So, and, and they have a lot of yogis, in fact. Uh, anyway, that's, that's how people interpret all these things. Yeah? You, don't, you, you don't see the... So, here when we see all these arising and passing away, we abandon all these solidity of permanence, you know, and things that is continuous. Because when you see things are continuous, there is a perception of it's going to be permanent. Uh, the conception, uh, sorry, the cognition and also the wrong view about what is going to be, what is permanent is based upon all these kind of things because we don't see it. Uh, so when we begin to see truly the anicca, we begin to break all these things and then, then the signs of, then the, then all this, this continuous manner of this mind and body uh, become very evident to the yogi. Hmm? Now, all these things, you see, this, this continuity, it will keep on going on until one becomes arahan. And of course, after one becomes arahan, one still see the discontinuous nature of mind and body. You know? But of course, there's nothing to be eradicated anymore. Yeah? So, of course, they still see the mind and body. It's not going to go anywhere yet. Uh, it's just that they, for them, it's already eradicated the defilement. So, we, we, we need to see these things in order for us to progress, in order so that the path consciousness is able to eradicate the defilement so we can get out of this samsara. Hmm? So, this is what it meant by to break down the continuity of of, of our misinterpretation. Huh? <clears throat> Next one. Solidity of mass, samukaha gana. Huh? Now the mass here is meant like uh, everything is being 
solidified together. Like for example, is that when we look at the nature of the, this body, hmm? now in science, this one is quite easy for us to understand. If you are more of a scientific, able to think more scientifically, huh? then this one is easier to understand. Then, then here just now I gave the, uh, this one, is that the mass is not one, but it is made up of atoms and oxygen and carbon and so on, you know, and they all come together to make things as one. So it so the thing is that we also the same thing. The body and the mind also the same thing. When we able to penetrate with wisdom, then we can begin to see that there is wind element, movements, we can see a hardness and softness. The hardness and softness is not the same. Yeah? Uh, the wind, the something that is moving and something hard, they are not the same. Yeah? Then we can we can able to begin to notice those things. Now sometimes uh, when we are in the meditation and and sometimes when we are more clear of what is going on with uh, let's say with the rising and falling. Within that rising and falling itself, uh, we are thought that to just to notice rising, falling, and so on. But as your mindfulness becomes sharper, sometimes you can notice that within the rising and falling, there is a hardness there. It's something that is something solid, but it's moving. The solidness is moving. Uh, or sometimes that you can able to feel some degree of warmness together with the rising and falling. And they are different. The warmness is one thing, rising fall, the movement is another thing. And you can able to differentiate these two quite clearly. You want to pay attention to the warmness, also can. You can pay attention to the rising also, also can. Or sometimes the yogi, because of its clarity, it can able to take all whatever that has come in front of it within the noting mind. Mm. You can able to notice those things. So it's, that is perfectly all right. As the mind is totally clear. Then, not only that, it can, as the, it can notice that things become clearer. Sometimes you notice that the movement of the rising falling is still there, but the f warmness starts to fade away. Uh, uh, then, or sometimes you begin to notice that the rising falling become even heavier or become like bloated in, a, in that sense. Yeah? Heavy, bloated, unpleasant. Sometimes it becomes very light, like a feather light, as if it goes on very smoothly. Yeah? Uh, so, so he begins to see a number of different characteristics of, of um, materiality, even within this body. Yeah? So it begins to able to that this rising and falling is not just rising and falling. Only. There are many other uh, components of the elements are also involved into it. Yeah? So you, we don't see all those things. Now, say, so do the same thing when we look into the mind. When we look into the mind, Initially, the yogi, as I said earlier, he just noticed that knowing only, the mind is knowing one solid thing, one, one thing only. Uh, you don't see any other thing. Uh, uh, then later on, you can able to feel something else. That when he noticed arising and falling, he noticed that the mind is alert and clear. Yeah, the mind is alert and clear. While it's at alert and clear at that time, huh? yeah, it's alert, it's clear. The mind also is very vibrant. Like it's energetic. Yeah. Alert and clear is one thing. Energetic is another thing. Then you begin to notice that there's different components within the noting mind within the, even the knowing mind of whatever that you are paying attention. 
So it's begin to break down on a different in the the solidity of the mind. You can able to notice those things. Yeah? Or sometimes you can able to notice different sets of noting. It's like for example, like the note as you notice thing, then the mind comes, it disappears. Come, it disappear. Come, it disappear. Then during that time, the yogi notice it as something as one gone, one gone, one gone. It's not something just one. Huh? It just come, then another one come, another one come. Huh? So it begin to again break down on the this one on solidity, on solidity of mass. Hmm. So. So here, this 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 uh, this solidity, they are very. I mean, they are all like intertwined, uh, intertwined together, and it depends on how you wrongly perceive the thing. Uh. In in reality. There's no such thing as continuity. There's no such thing as solidity or mass or, or all these things. Uh, it's just our misconception towards all those things. Uh. So mass is like when you see see everything together. You don't see it into its all its different components. Uh. <clears throat> or something like the mass also the same thing is like when you are looking at things or when you are hearing uh, you can't you can't differentiate an object of hearing let's say uh, object of hearing consciousness of hearing you can you know, then the thoughts that arises from the consciousness or the feeling arises from the consciousness of that hearing process. So everything is all like intertwined together. We cannot able to differentiate everything else. We cannot. And because everything is all come together. Yeah. Solidity of mass. Solidity of function. Yeah. Here again, we see like, we thought that initially when we meditation, yeah, we thought that the mind is just only one thing only that is just to know. Huh? But as we meditate further, then we know that there are different functions of a noting mind. Huh? Last time, it has, I think that many years ago, eight or nine, how many years, maybe 10 years ago, I gave a talk during a retreat, during a retreat, I gave when you not, when you have a noting mind, what is inside the noting mind? Yeah. And when you got your curry chicken, what is inside all your curry chicken? Uh, that one is how I teach you, you know. Uh, then how I how we can cook them up, <laughs> how we can develop that noting mind, uh, which is more important than your chicken curry. Mm. Yeah. So here is the same thing. So when we look at the function, uh, for example, when you learn about the five faculties, uh, when we learn about the five faculties, we learn about its different function. What does mindfulness do? What does the concentration do? What does the wisdom factor do? What does the effort do? What does the uh, faith or the confidence, sadha, what does it do? Uh, we, we, we look into all those things. Yeah? We look into all those things, at least on theoret theoretically, which is in line when you come into the meditation. Uh, so when you are in the meditation, actually you can feel that at times, especially when you want to talk about the balancing of the faculties, uh, then you are actually balance the faculties on the go. Yeah? That, that while you are meditating, uh, then effort become too much. And then you know the function of effort, it become too much. Oh, the mind becomes starts more thinking already. So you lower down that effort a little bit. Now. Then you, you increase the, 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 the concentration or increase the mindfulness a little bit. You know? So you know a certain functional thing 
of the noting mind, which is not just one thing, but you can able to, in a way, fine tune it, which is good, you know, we, we can able to fine tune it in order for us to progress even further. Yeah? And this type of balancing, and def therefore you must understand their functions, the na different nature of the mind, how they function, and it becomes very helpful for your meditation progress. Yeah? Uh, so, because not all the time, the mind is going to be clear and precise and sharp all the time. They are still subject to impermanence. They are going to come, they're going to go due to different conditions. So understanding their condition, then be able to to um, to change the the this one and it, it brings back to the clarity. Yeah. Then people say, but they, if you do like that, uh, don't you think you're controlling your own mind? Uh? <laughs> Finally. No, don't you think you're still controlling your own mind? Uh, during that time, during that time, huh? Your mindfulness is so sharp. Yeah? Your mindfulness is clear. It knows how to auto-tune itself. La, you know? This is just while we are talking on it. You know? While we are talking on it. Initially, of course, you learn how to do it. But after you get used to it, huh? you kind of like know how to auto-tune itself uh, to, to the best, best uh, most optimum way of noting. Yeah? So it knows how to do, it knows how to, but at the time uh, you can see that how this functional thing uh, is also cause and effect. You you arouse it a bit, then this thing will like, come. You decrease this and you go like that. You know, things like that. Uh. You, you can see it's different function very clearly. Uh. So in that sense, uh, we break away from that misinterpretation of solidity of function. Uh. <clears throat> Now, solidity of object, here is where how your mind takes upon the object. The mind takes object, the body cannot take, ob take object, all right? We make it there. The mind takes object. The mind takes an object, that means the mind can take materiality as an object, or it can take other mi minds as its object, it can take itself as an object. Yeah? Because the mind itself, there's only not just only one mind. You know? For example, when you're sleepy, how do you know you're sleepy? The mind knows the mind. Yeah? How you're, when your mind is thinking so much, how do you know you're thinking? The mind knows the mind. The noting mind knows the thinking mind. Yeah? In order for us to, to describe it during the talk, okay, we use a different name. But while we are doing in the re meditation, uh, things are going much more faster. Uh, things change more faster. You only have to pay attention to it. Uh, if you are clear, you can see that the thinking disappear. If you're not clear, you see the thinking getting more and more. Uh, uh, so when you notice that, the mind can able to notice there are different types of object that is coming in. Several different objects. Uh, like for example, uh, when you are meditating, in the beginning of meditation, uh, you notice that, uh, or you are thought, uh, you are thought, and most of the yogis are usually thought in this way, your mind can only take one object at a time. In a way, I'm not saying it's wrong, in a way it's true, but you are not looking at another big area which is being covered and which is thing being not said. You know. The what is not said is the, the 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 quickness of what we mean by one thing, the one the one consciousness and take one object at a at a time. You know. The quickness of the mind uh, or the or the such of mind can go so fast. Uh, that it can, when it takes object, when it takes, because it's so fast, 
we see the whole object as one. That's how we do, you know. That's how we function every day. We, we see them as one. But when you go into the deeper aspect of meditation, uh, you can able to notice that, uh, that the object itself is not one, but your mind can, can notice it one after another. But it looks like it's one from the outside. Now, sometimes if you are more of a meditator, that when you are meditating and things are very clear, sometimes as if like uh, you are can taking several objects at the same time. Several objects. Like for example, like consciousness arises, hearing consciousness, one another one, then sensation of pain arises, rising, falling arises, sometimes heartbeat also you can feel. Now, when you pay attention to it, uh, as if like the whole mind can look into all those things, sakali, you know, at one go. Yeah. And you thought that, hey, 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 cannot, cannot. I've been taught to take one object at one time only. How can all these so many objects Akali come? They all come together. My meditation must be doing, I'm doing something wrong with my meditation. No, you're not. That is usually what yogis think. But this is exactly, it breaks down the solidity of the object. That you, when, you, when, we, when the mind becomes much more faster, the noting mind becomes much more fluid and this one, and it takes object sometimes at just one moment only, then it's already moved to another object, then it's already moved to another object, and then moved to another object. So while you are noting the whole, let's say five or six objects together, the mind is actually taking it at one at a one time, but you cannot see because the quickness of the mind, one after another, you cannot see it. It's so much more faster than you're noting, than you're able to know what is going on. But you can know that there are several objects that is you're being taking in together. As if like you put a noting mind there, you will see and see a number of objects is happening inside. There. It's like a helicopter view, not just one to one, you know, not just one, one noting mind or one rising, one noting mind, one falling. Those days in the beginning, when you begin, yes, it happened like that. If you have so many other objects, your mind gets scattered. But this time different, as you go deeper, you can able to see that the mind can take in Different minds are, but because of the quickness of the mind, such a fast quickness of the mind that several objects are already coming in so fast as if while you're noting it, they look as if like a single noting mind can take all of them as if. Uh, but it, it, that one is good because that time when you can able to see the mind can able to break down all the objects in a very fast manner. No? So don't underestimate this these experiences. Huh? Sometimes there are even teachers that say is that oh no 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 you must not see all this type of thing. Go back to rising, falling, rising, falling. Take you can take one this one at one time only. Sometimes you know even sometimes yogis see it now. Huh? But sometimes there are certain teachers that, you know, they, they stop the yogi from looking at it. Uh, even the yogi is able to progress quite well, you know. But once in a while, also in the beginning part of the meditation, uh, in the beginning part of meditation, you can actually, once in a while, it comes in this way. It's just that sometimes we just, yogis just ignore it because it may not be so prominent thing. But in the, in the later on, these things can be very prominent. So you can see that it, all this solidity of objects uh, that it can able to break down in so many ways. Therefore, when we understand these things, when we 
come out of it. Uh, then you can see that how our mind, uh, here we can talk, uh, hand also can move. Uh, head also can move. Here also can drink water. Uh, but everything, one moment at a time. Everything. Although it looks like all everything are doing it together, but the, because the mind is just so fast. And that shows in the vipassana as you get deeper into the meditation okay so next time if you so happen to see these type of things so don't get shocked yeah? don't get shocked yeah. uh, <clears throat> so let's go back to the screen sharing all right so this is the it, it removes all this wrong interpretation so seeing things as they really are you just only you pay attention to it squarely clearly then you begin to abandon all this misinterpretation of solidity hmm? a 946 okay all right let's look into another three more of uh, 18 of the 18 contemplation then here we're going to that's in a way kind of repeat again. Yeah. All right. This is contemplation number 11, 12, and 13. Okay. One who develops the contemplation of signless animita abandons the sign. One who develops the contemplation of desireless apanihita abandons desire. One who develops the contemplation of voidness, sunya abandons the misinterpretation. Actually, misinterpretation of formation. Uh, but because the translation is like that in the text, so they just put that misinterpreting. Misinterpreting. But misinterpreting of actually formation. Actually, actually misinterpreting of formations here. Mind and body, in other words. Uh. Okay. Now, 11, 12, and 13, this one is synonymously with the impermanence, which is, which is anicca. Number 12 is synonymous with dukkha. And 13 is non-self, voidness. Uh, uh, <clears throat> now, we look into number 11, uh, animita. The word you use nimita here, I we need to do a little bit this one. Okay. Now usually when we use the word nimita, many of us just use it as, you know, and we think that the word nimita is just for uh what do you call it? Samatha meditation. Uh, you meditate in breath, out breath after they got nimitta arises, which is mentally created nimitta, which is a concept. Uh, concept. But here we use the word nimitta in a more different context altogether. Not mind made, but actually it's real. It's a re it's reality, it's, it's an ultimate reality in that in that sense. Uh. Usually we just use the word object. Uh, usually, we, English, we just use the word object or use, use the word conditional phenomena uh, of formations. Formation here, Sankara. So, Sankara Nimita. Uh, so, the word Sankara here, it means body and mind. Uh, inclusive body and mind. Not the five aggregate Sankara, but the five aggregate Sankara is just only for the mind part. But here is involve body and mind. All these are being formed. Uh, all these are being formed. <clears throat> so, in the in the um, contemplation of signlessness or noting on the signlessness, uh, here when we don't see what we call the sign of permanence, the sign of stability, or the sign of eternity yeah. so again here is again is a repetition again yeah. repetition in the sense that when you begin to see things phenomena breaking up 
going into destruction, going into dissolution, arising and passing away and keep on disappearing or breaking up, then it, it then strengthens that perception of impermanence, anicca, dupasana, then here the sign of permanence disappear. Also the same thing that when we begin to see all this nature of instability, that everything goes into viparinama, goes into change, nothing for us to hold on to, now, then the sign of stability also disappear. So then the sign of eternity, sasata nimitta, the sign of in eternity also, the concept of eternity also abandons at that moment of time. Uh, therefore, if there's no sign of in eternity, therefore, the wrong perception of eternity will not arise, the cognition of eternity of uh, not arise, therefore the wrong view of eternity will not arise. Uh, this is the sasata diti, you know, the wrong view of eternity uh, that we learn in the Four Noble Truth, in the Second Noble Truth, uh, uh, the, the, the wrong view of eternity. So here we break up all these type of things. Uh, we break all these things. Now, the so this is again the same as impermanent. Uh, the same as impermanent. Then the, the, the 12 also the same thing, desireless, because when you see all this type of phenomena arising and passing away, everything changes. That's, the mind does not want to hold on to it, want to crave for it. Uh, it it's just like... Some, when you meet with people, uh, these people, the mood keep on changing. Morning, one mood. Afternoon, another mood. And night, another mood. You don't want to go near the person. You want to stay away. You don't, you don't feel any sort of desire towards the person. Uh, you want to stay away from the, this one. So desire. So, so the same thing. Whatever formation uh, that you see all this like ar arising, passing away, and so on, uh, it becomes very oppressive to you. You become very oppressive, uh, unpleasant, and so on. Then, is there any craving towards them? Then no. The mind doesn't want to crave for all this type of reason. Uh, so it's a kind of, again, dukkha. Number 13, here, a contemplation of voidness. Now, here, the contemplation of voidness, it also like connected to non-self. In the sense that when you are Let's say in the first stage of insight, uh, the first level of insight, you see the dis, uh, this distinguishing of mind and matter. You see this mind and matter, th this one. Now, that too also is a form of contemplation of void because here the void or the emptiness, uh, sunya, sunya or su here it, it doesn't mean that there's nothing, you know, empty, kang kang, you know, not, not nothing. Uh. What it means here is that it's void of a self, it's void of a soul, it's void of a third entity, whichever that you this one, whichever you believe from from your wrong view. Yeah. So what you see is only mind and matter, which is which is there only. Uh, there's no, no other third entity. So it's void of that. So a lot of people, this when they use the word sunya, then they use it as completely empty. That, that means uh, when you meditate until, uh, until everything go blank. <laughs> All the mind, everything goes blank. Hose liao, nibbana liao. <laughs> but that is not what it meant by the Buddha. The void does not mean, or the emptiness, sometimes they translate as emptiness. Huh? So just don't, don't think as like your, your, you look into the empty tin or empty, uh, everything, nothing is inside that. Huh? No, it's not that. Void, there is still mind and matter. You know? There's still mind and matter, except that they don't have the, 
they don't have the uh, self or soul inside there or, or external jiwa atta uh, no, or their parama atta and so on. Uh, they don't have those type of things. So it abandons the misinterpretation of formation because the misinterpretation of formation there's belief that there is a self, there's a thing inside that. Uh, uh, now, the reason I I I take this tree for tonight and also maybe we ne next Monday also because this tree is going to be important when you're going to when you are just about to enter or realize nibbana. Yeah? As you're going to enter or realize nibbana, this one of these three is going to be important for you. Uh, now, where did I have this one? Okay, now we go to this one again. Here you see the, the red colored one that I highlight. Uh, and at the number 12, uh, actually is Anicca or Dukkha or anatta, all right? It's different from number three, knowledge of comprehension. Anicca, dukkha, and anatta, you know, okay? So here I put anicca, or dukkha, or anatta. Here, what, what the thing is that when we go back to the knowledge of equanimity of formations, here, the knowledge of equanimity of formations, it's going to be very, mind is going to be very alert, very clear. As I said, it's going to be, have a long lasting practice. Even though they say that uh, the, the mind is like an arahan, you know, at this, at this time, you know, uh, according to the text, you know, knowledge of equanimity towards formation. Towards formation here is all towards the sign, towards mind and body, towards the sankara. Yeah? So while, he, while you are here, you notice all your insights, you know, arising, passing away, going to destruction, changing, and totally you are not delighted at all. And also you are not affected by all the forms of dukkha and all kinds of oppression. But you are still at the knowledge of equanimity of formations. So here, as you pick up as you mentally you get matured as as the mindfulness gets stronger more powerful and so on so when it comes to this insight of equanimity of formations and then when you go to the knowledge number 12 in between here it's where is you are going to see whether you are going to see anicca, dukkha, or anatta. So therefore, it, it has a name for it, you know. They call it the triple gateway of liberation. Now, last year, we talked about this thing in the third noble truth. Yeah? In the third noble truth, we talked about this thing, the triple gateway of liberation. And also, of course, other time also, I talked about it also. Again, here you see the word signless liberation okay desireless liberation and void or emptiness liberation sunya vimoka this one this apanihita vimoka signless is uh, animita vimoka all right now for for those with signless liberation that means you, your faith is predominant and your adimoka also is predominant, which faith and adimoka they come together. Yeah? Number two is that uh, uh, your desireless liberation, that means your concentration or your tranquility is predominant. Then your third one is your void or emptiness liberation, then wisdom is predominant. When you say this liberation, uh, that means you already touch. Uh, you already touched Nibbana, but before you touch Nibbana, what happened is that at the knowledge of equanimity here, uh, the 
bit of the noting is going to pick up. Right? It's going to pick up for Nibbana already. It's going to pick up in such a way that um, things is going to, everything is going to get, everything is just fast on it. Every, anything that you notice is going to be arising and, and passing away. Maybe like, maybe lah, just give you a, in the past, uh, in the past, you notice like one second, one noting. Uh, yeah? Okay, one second, one noting. But this time, it's going to be like within the second, there are 10 notings already gone through. Yeah? Pick up speed. Uh, yeah? they pick up. That means uh, you, your mind is you're going to be able to notice things, it's going to pick up. Now, while things are picking up, the, the things is picking up, and then you're going to see this movement. This is such a fast movement of arising and passing away, huh? of this change and so on. Huh? Now, how you perceive this arising and passing away, it depends on your predominant. It depends on your quality. So if you are more faith quality, you will see this arising and passing manner in a very fast manner. You see them as impermanent. So when you see this time as impermanent, later part when there's liberation take place, Nibbana take place, then that Nibbana, we call it the signless liberation because you go through from seeing impermanence and then Nibbana later on take place. So this impermanence is so much more faster than the earlier one that we talked before. Yeah? And yet, at that moment of time, we see that the there's no continuity there's there's no um solidity you know uh, all this there's no uh, there's always arising passing away so you don't see any form of sign or any form of of continuity in that sense so when you reach liberation is called is called signless liberation of signless liberation, yes. So number two, the desireless liberation. Again here, when you see this fast manner and according to your own predominance, then again you see it as dukkha and you see it as oppressive. The arising and passing away is such, such a fast manner, but this time you look at it, ugh, like something that you are, you, you just want to, want to put it aside, you know, but you are still observing. So at that time, you are watching it. So when you are ready for it, enlightenment takes place, then it's called desireless liberation. Then the third one, the third one is called empty liberation, wisdom. Here again, when you use the word empty, it does not mean that it's nothing inside that. Again, it's the same arising and passing away. It's such a fast manner that you look at it that all this fast, manner of arising and passing away, it does not have a self at all, does not even at your control, does not, you cannot control it, it's all chaotic inside there. You watch it and later on, you attain liberation. Yeah? Uh, so, then Nibbana takes, Nibbana being realized. Huh? Uh, but, Say is easy because it's at, at that this triple gateway liberation. Sometimes some yogis, uh, what happened is this. They are, you know, you know, it, it give you it give you a simile. They they cannot reach nibbana. They reach getting then things go back again to knowledge of equanimity. It slow down. Go again. Cannot reach Nibbana. Cannot attain Nibbana. Why? I don't know why. <laughs> now, the thing is that at this stage, uh, sometimes, who knows, uh, you know, in the past you do something wrong and then they really go and block you. Maybe maybe in the past you're going to... Uh, you're going to uh, you're going to say something bad about some enlightened people, then also block. <laughs> Maybe lah, you know, I'm saying, <laughs> I'm not sure. So we really do not know. Uh, it just cannot reach. It's just like how, you know, sometimes I look at it, uh, it's like you have a car, you have a car, 
then you have a now you have a hill to climb up. But you ram up your car, you want to cross over the hill, you you go halfway, huh? Your car no strength, not enough horsepower, huh? okay, then go down again. Then you then after that you go to ram up again, halfway on the air, and then come back. So a lot of time they just go up, come down, I cannot cross over. Yeah. Because bo kao lat don't know lah, don't know what they have this missing, you know. So what are you going to do right now? So for if you are there, make sure you keep on practice and practice and practice and practice. Who knows, you know? So near and yet so far. <laughs> so this is on the triple gateway of liberation. Because they use the word apanihita and all that and it comes right at the doorstep of Nibbana. Impermanence, uh, unsatisfactoriness and the this one yeah? so we talk about here we're going to look into it a little bit on Monday yeah? some other some other 18 principles of insight some of the insight that we have not looked into it yet we're going to look into it and also we're going to look with this a little bit more all right so it's already 10.06 already so we stop here for tonight yeah <clears throat>